What's up? What's up, bro? Looking good, man. You're looking Thank good. Thanks, bro. Kind of like Rambo, kind of with that bandana. <laughs> Let's ride the wave, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. That's what we're talking about, right? Like hang waves that's, and gnarly, that's right. That's gnarly right. lip twists or whatever they say out there. <laughs> gnarly lip twists. I don't know. What's up, man? How you doing? You're looking good. How, how's it going? What? Are, this is sorry. Uh, you know what this ahead. headband is? You know what this headband is from? Yeah, I got one. I got one last night. We went to the Flyers game. Was that your first uh, hockey game? You know, I uh, no, I, I try to go to a couple each year. Um, mm-hmm. Was it your first? That was my first ever hockey. 40, almost think? 47, almost 40, few days, I'll be 47, first hockey game. What'd you um, think? Before I went, uh, Jared Klein, one of our colleagues, said, it is the most exciting sport to watch live. And I was like, whatever, basketball's the best sport. It was incredible. Those guys are yeah. nonstop. All the nudging, the hook sticks, and all that stuff. I was like, I didn't know what was happening, but it was awesome. Yeah, it's constant play. There's very few like interruptions of play, and that they're they're so fast and so strong. And it's uh and like when a goal, oh man, it's it's fun. It's it was fun. great. It's great. It was great. Yeah, I love it. Well, well um, so, so what are we uh, what are we talking about? Let's get to business. We're already starting late. So. Yeah, for sure. We're gonna bring on our guest in just one moment and introduce him. But today we're talking about waveform analysis. Someone once said that uh, this is analogous. This is the EKG for the pulmonologist. And I was like, ah, just pulmonologist. It's for the, anyone who manages a vent should know what these waveforms are, just like any cardiologist or emergency medicine physician should know what an ECG is. I thought that was a really good analogy, uh, right? I was going to say, isn't that what the PFT is? But, uh, but, but we don't need We're to not argue. talking ever no. about PFTs on this show. Just oh, man, that. I love PFTs. I know you do. I know you do. But that's a different show. It gets me, gets me going. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I, first off, I've spent my whole career thinking dyssynchrony is a word. I don't know if dyssynchrony is a word. So I've started calling it asynchrony. Yeah. Uh, Every time I type in dyssynchrony into chat GPT, which yeah. is talk for another, it always corrects it. And there's no dyssynchrony on the autocorrect. So I think you're right. I think it's asynchrony, but dyssynchrony sounds so much more academic. Yeah. But I don't know how many S's and like Y's and stuff. Dis- and so I, yeah, I get confused. True. It's like Mississippi. Um, so, so what I want to do, I'm going to kind of give a brief overview. We're going to bring mm-hmm. our guests on in a second, but what we're going to do is talk about waveform analysis of a normal breath, and then we're going to go through each stage of the breath and talk about the types of asynchronies for that stage. And there'll be some that we just mentioned and briefly go through, and there's going to be some that we're going to flash images and go into depth. But um I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be a really, really fun um, episode. We have a lot to cover. Um, Should should we we talk about our guest? Yeah, Yeah, let's bring him on. We should mention, we should mention who's here. We have the one, the only, Cooper alumni, critical care, fellowship trained, and at ICU Explained, Dr. Obi Anobi. What is up? Hey, guys. (laughs) You know... I, I would like to say before before Obi you you steal the show is that you have a lot of wonderful qualities both um, both physical and mental but your beard has always been my favorite so you can see I've spent <laughs> I've spent the last three three weeks growing a beard you can see so I can look like you how am I doing it's pretty good huh it's a couple more weeks and you're you're almost there yeah, yeah. You're, you're almost there yeah yeah i this this is a cycle where i decide i'm going to grow a beard and it goes and then my wife tells me that she's done and that i can sleep in a different room and then i shave and then like six months later i decide it's a good idea again so uh oh. we're we'll see where this takes me yeah hey, hey just keep 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 doing it man it's, it's yeah. gonna it'll, it'll be bigger than mine soon <laughs> <laughs> all right buddy so um i can't say enough about ob ob is uh I'm just excited to, to learn from him, his web, his site, everyone should follow as you explained. Great, great, great physiology, great knowledge. And uh, he's a good guy. He uh, He's a good guy. He's legendary. He knows, he, he's legendary. Yeah, I can't even. The OB stories are still circul- circulating the halls of uh, They the echo halls through of, the hallways. If yeah, you listen on a quiet right. night and you yeah. listen, you'll still hear the stories. It's, the uh, only thing I'm wondering is what happened to that fanny pack. That's all I want to know. But. It's uh, <laughs> 
we bronzed it, and actually, it's at the threshold now of the ICU. Everyone walks yeah, in right. walks under the fanny pack. The gold. It's like fanny. Ed Viner's face, and then yes. your fanny pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now right, goofing buddy. around. Let's get this started. Right. So, so here's going to be the first question, and Ed, here's the first sure. question. So, I I want to spend just a second talking about um, different settings for pressure assist control and and volume assist control. And we're not going to get too dorky about the mode of ventilation because I think we could just really get into that. But I just want to talk about the settings for each of those, what you set, what is dependent on the lung condition that you don't set. And uh, yeah, so tell me about that. So, so talk to me about the difference between volume control and pressure control. Sure. So, so volume control and, and, and pressure control, especially if you're learning ventilators, is they both are the two common ventilator modes that you use as kind of like a bridge point to learn everything else about mechanical ventilation. But they do differ based on the different settings you can achieve with both. So with volume control, that would be the the user, the provider is setting the volume, which is basically a dependent variable, and it'll be also a limit variable. So you'll set a volume and based off that volume, um, your and depending on the respiratory man uh, mechanics, your pressure will be dependent on the volume you set. Um, you also set a, um, a flow, like a, a flow rate, which is actually fixed. And that's that kind of, that's one of the differences between volume control and pressure control is that you'll set your volume, you'll set your flow rate, and depending on the patient's respiratory mechanics, the airway pressure that's achieved with that, after that tidal volume will be dependent on their respiratory mechanics. And um, with pressure control, it's a little bit different. Um, you set a, a pressure that you're going to get above the PEEP and you'll set an inspiratory time. And based off of the respiratory mechanics, your tidal volume will be dependent. So if you have good compliance and not a lot of airway resistance, then you may get a good tidal volume based off the pressure you set. Um, if you have poor compliance and, and a lot of error resistance, then with that pressure you set, you may not get good tidal volume. That's great. That's that's exactly right. So I like to think about it as what is independent of the patient, i.e. you set it, and what is dependent on the patient, i.e. the patient's physiology determines it. So volume control, you set a tidal volume that's independent of the patient. 400 cc's is going into those lungs no matter what, right? And what's dependent on the patient is the pressure. So you're at risk for aerotrauma for volume control. Pressure control, on the other hand, like you said, it is independent, the inspiratory pressure over a PEEP. What is dependent on the patient is how much volume goes in. So which mode is better? I'm gonna say neither. Uh, so I think we tend to pick volume control, why? because it's a guaranteed minute ventilation, right? Pressure control, like you said, if the lungs are get stiffer, the amount of volume going in goes down, minute ventilation goes down, they become acidotic, right? Um, that's awesome. Yeah, so thanks for saying I think, that. I, I just have to say, because I hear so many debates of people saying pressure mode is a superior mode of ventilation or volume mode is a superior mode of ventilation. And there's probably, these, there is some nuances in there, but let's just all agree. Like one is the independent variable, one is the dependent variable. When you follow one, you have to look at the other, no matter what mode you're in. So thank you for saying yep. that, Adam. Yep. I always say, what's the best mode? The one that the ICU is comfortable with. Like the one the nurse likes, the one the respiratory likes, that's the best mode for that ICU. And it's different for different ICUs. And that, that's a big thing. Yeah, it does, it does differ um, from, from institution to institution. Some places like, um, Actually, I've seen a lot of SIMV in different places. Some patients, uh, some places like PRVC, pressure control, volume control. But what matters most is that you set a ventilator, you put the ventilator settings, and you don't walk away because ventilation is a dynamic process. So you have Love to be, and, and, the, and the situation and the clinical parameters of the patient are constantly changing, adapting. So regardless of the mode that you choose, what matters most is continuous assessment. Beautiful, but I'm going to cut you off because we're not talking about modes. All right, so you already dropped a ton that that you you went over. That's strike one, Obi. All right, um, Dr. Malmat, let's see the next. Let's see the first slide. I want to see this slide. Uh, first slide. Oh, so watch this. this. Watch. We we, we spared were no expense terms. for this show. Look Boom. at that. 
So we are going to talk about trigger. We're going to talk about cycle. Can you walk me through this slide? And first off, what mode do we think this is? So it's going to, so I always think, you know, and it's a little bit hard because we don't have all three, but it's probably volume control, right? Because if it was pressure control, look at what's flat. So volume control flow is flat for pressure control. Pressure is flat. So this is not flat. So it's probably volume control, right? That would be pressure control. Cool. So talk me through trigger, cycle. What the heck do these words mean? How do you think about it? Um, let's start yeah. there. Yeah. So you see the four phases of mechanical ventilation there, starting with the initiation phase, which can also be considered like triggering. So at the first line, you're looking at that first uh, a straight line before the horizontal dash line before the triggering arrow. That's at the end of exhalation. And then you get to what's called the triggering phase. And the triggering is what basically triggers the ventilator that, hey, it's time for me to start delivering a breath. And that could either be um, based off of uh, time, flow, or, or pressure. And then um, the next phase you see is the inhalation phase when the, act the ventilator actually delivers the breath. And that can be based off of a volume limit or, or pressure. And those dependent variables, it's funny, they become limit variables. For instance, if you say, if you're on volume control and your tidal volume is 400, then that will be a limit of your, of your inhalation. Um, if you're on pressure control, it could be time. That could be a limit of your, of your um, inspiration as well as your as pressure. So then when you get to that next uh, vertical dash line um, after the inspiratory phase, that's called the cycling phase. The cycling phase essentially is what makes the ventilator cycle from inhalation to exhalation. So the inhalation valve closes, the exhalation valve opens, and, um, and the patient starts to exhale. So cycling, it also, what makes the ventilator or what triggers the ventilator to cycle um, depends on the mode that you're in. So if it was volume control, it would be based off of volume. If it was a pressure mode, it would be based essentially off time, unless it was pressure support. It could even be flow, it could be flow cycled. Um, and then you see that the pressure starts to go down because the patient's exhaling, that's the exhalation fa phase. And really the only variable there you're adjusting is your PEEP, which is the pressure left in, in, the, in lungs at the end of uh, exhalation. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, so so this is that's perfect. This is the way I think about it. So it triggers the start of the breath, which is either patient triggered, i.e. they take enough breath in, the ventilator notices, okay, the patient wants to breathe and it delivers the breath, right? Or it's time triggered. So the patient doesn't breathe for a set amount of time and the machine kicks in. So for example, if the respiratory was 20, 60 divided by 20 is three seconds. So if three seconds goes, the patient hasn't taken in enough negative flow, then all of a sudden the machine will kick in and give a breath. Doesn't matter what mode you're on, volume control, pressure control, it's those two things, okay? And I'm, and I'm intentionally gonna try to avoid pressure support and getting into all those nuanced other modes because just trying to keep it as simple as we can. And then you're, you're right, inspiratory phase. So in volume control, it is tidal volume in pressure control it is time and then cycle for when it cycles and the breath ends and so that that's as simple as it is that's perfect cool so i think now that we've set this what i think we should do is talk about the asynchronies for each of those four so trigger asynchronies inspiratory phase asynchronies cycling asynchronies and then what i'm going to lump in as an expiratory phase asynchrony and we're going to go through each one of that is that cool Awesome. Yeah, and I, good. I just want to tell everyone at home, because some of these concepts, it took me many times of reviewing it to understand this. We have a handout for you at the end of the show that everyone is going to get. You're going to go to the website, download this link, uh, download this PDF, and you will have what we're talking about here. So these slides, you'll have them afterwards as worksheets that you can keep working through. Certainly try to focus as much as you can on this, but just know that after the end, you're going to get these waveforms as well. Cool. So Absolutely. I know that was a little confusing, but I think as we go through each one, we're just going to kind of keep dumping those concepts and, uh, and, and we'll get there. So let's talk about, and I should say, I, I, on the script, I say I have a big disclaimer and the disclaimer is each one of these asynchronies gets probably 
deserves an entire hour just talking about it. And I promise you guys, I know you guys are going to go and start Googling them and it's going to get overwhelming because people use kind of different terms interchangeably and it gets really, really hard. So let's, we'll, uh, we'll try to keep it, keep it as, as brief as we can. So let's talk about trigger asynchronies. In other words, what are the types of problems where the patient wants a breath and, and doesn't get one? or the patient doesn't want a breath and does get one, right? Because all asynchrony means is what? It just means that the vent's not giving the patient the breath it wants. Like our goal is to set the ventilator so that it interacts with the patient perfectly. So what are the types of trigger asynchronies that you think of? So there is um, ineffective triggering, there is double triggering, um, there is reverse triggering, and there is auto triggering, which is even which is an interesting phenomenon. And so actually reverse triggering and auto triggering are pretty interesting phenomenons on their own. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. So ineffective triggering. So I, I think our little, um, our, our algorithm should be, show me how, what the problem is. Tell me like, how do you recognize ineffective triggering on the flow, on the, on the vent waveforms? Uh, what's the real issue and kind of how do you fix it? So if we're going to show you a slide that shows ineffective triggering and kind of walk me through it. Sure. So you can see the first two breaths. So it looks like you even have a, on the bottom one there, you have the bottom waveform there, you have esophageal pressure. So you can actually see um, when the patient's actually trying to initiate a breath because the pleural pressure drops. So the first two breaths there are, are successfully are successfully recognized by the ventilator, but the third breath, it, it seems to be missed. So the third breath, it looks like, you know, in that flow waveform, there's a little bit of a deflection there, but it's underneath the baseline. So it looks like the patient tried to take a breath. And actually, if you look at the top waveform and the airway pressure, you know that the patient tried to take a breath because there's a little drop in the airway pressure. Perfect. So there was muscular effort to trigger the ventilator that, hey, I want to take a breath, but the ventilator did not deliver. So there was an ineffective trigger or a wasted effort. That's right. And we don't always have this actual probe. I just think it really helps here because you can yeah. see with that negative deflection that they want to take a breath. And, and we should also talk about the difference between assisted breaths and controlled breath, right? So assisted breath means the patient is breathing on their own. Controlled means they didn't breathe. And so the machine just delivered the breath automatically. So that, and you're right, that's what you see is that little negative deflection is perfect. So that's ineffective triggering, right? So how, uh, Basically, the patient wants a breath and they're not getting it. So how do we fix that? So you, there are two things or there are, several, there are several things that one must consider when you see an ineffective trigger. And the first thing is, is, is the ineffective trigger, trigger because there is just an ineffective effort by the patient, i.e. there's respiratory muscle weakness and they just can't uh, uh, trigger the ventilator? Or is the, is the effort actually normal, but the threshold to actually receive that breath is higher because there could be retained air like intrinsic peep. In the setting of intrinsic peep, that threshold to, to trigger the ventilator becomes that much higher because they have to overcome their own auto peep and then the, the actual normal baseline threshold of the ventilator to get that breath. So when it's uh, um, in patients that actually have just rest, respiratory muscle weakness, one of the things that you can see are patients that are getting way too sedated, right? If, they're, if, if you're getting too sedated, then there's a chance that there'll be respiratory muscle weakness just from, from profound sedation. Uh, or patients that have been on neuromuscular blockade, there's natural uh, respiratory muscle weakness. Or even um, patients that are alkalotic, that's, that's a big deal, I think. Patients that are alkalotic because yep. then you're, you're reducing their neural drive. If you're reducing the neural drive to breathe, then it's hard to expect that the efforts they generate are gonna produce much. And, and often I've seen uh, patients are put on an arbitrary rate of 20, you know, on a ventilator and they become alkalotic pretty quickly. Then you can't expect that they're gonna generate great efforts. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean. There's two sides of the equation, right? There's the ventilator and the patient. So there's a problem with one exactly. of them. So either the patient isn't breathing in strong enough. So that's yeah. usually a sedation related, but you're right, respiratory alkalosis, PCO2 too low. They're not dry, they don't have that big enough drive, so they can't they can't overcome it. And then the second would be 
that the machine is sent too high. So the sensitivity or too low, rather, the sensitivity is too low. And you need to make the machine a little bit more sensitive to the patient effort. And you can change that. Um, I think the idea of intrinsic PEEP, and I kind of left it off. I, I think that's, um, I've heard mixed things about it. So, and I've heard that they're usually triggered by flow, not necessarily by pressure. So even if you have a lot of intrinsic PEEP, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit about it, but you have enough flow to ask for a breath, the machine should give the breath. Um, I've I, I I've been taught what you said too, so I don't know the I don't know the actual answer to that. I don't know, Haney, what what your thought has been because um, I've I've done things like increase my peep to overcome the intrinsic peep, but I don't know right. if you have to do that. Not anymore. I, I I think most of the modern ventilators have those two triggers built in. So like you said. You know, you have the flow trigger as your default, but um, traditionally it was a pressure trigger and you would have to decrease the sensitivity to get that effect. But it is still a good, I, th I think it is still good to talk about, maybe not so much on this show, but still to learn the concept of auto peep and increasing it. Um, so maybe we'll park that for a different day when we talk about someone like yeah. severe asthma or, you know, or COPD with breast stacking. Yeah, yeah. I think it comes in a little bit later on one of them too. So yeah, we'll talk. But exactly. yeah, I agree. Auto peep and intrinsic percentrix at peep is it's its own topic that's worth discussing. Um, okay, good. So I maybe we should pause for a second. I see we have about twenty viewers. Are there questions specifically about ineffective triggering? Because it probably is easiest to address questions for each one as we're as we're there. Um, so go ahead and type in the chat if there's anything you want us to ask about ineffective triggering. Really simple. Patient wants a breath, machine's not giving it. That's all it is. You see that deflection and flow, you see a slight bump in pressure, but you don't see an actual breath with pressure going up. While we're waiting for a question to pop up, I mean, what is the, you know, how do you get alerted to this situation when you have this? Like, you know, you might have a patient who's just on the ventilator and you're driving in the rate. When do you, when does this become an issue to, you know, unless you're actually sitting there watching the patient every breath, how do you realize that this is actually happening? One, one thing you can do um, is, I, I think it, it's easy to lose focus of actually looking at the patient, you know, and, and when you're doing your daily assessments, you know, when I walk into the patient's room and I look at them, uh, and when you're doing your physical examination, an easy thing to do is just Put your hand on the solar plexus and just feel the movements and sometimes you can feel that they're generating like some kind of effort but the machine is not responding in kind and that can be a, a simple alert that um that there that there's ineffective efforts another thing is to have an index of suspicion i mean because when patients have ineffective efforts like this it actually uses energy they're using energy on their wasted efforts which means that when you actually try to wean them, they may be too tired to actually, you know, do CPAP and, and pass. So then you need to start thinking, well, why is my patient unable to tolerate CPAP? What, what's going on here? And that might demand you spending more focused attention on that patient. And then you might notice these things because the ventilator won't necessarily alarm for an, an effective right. effort. Well, this is, yeah. this is a good point because this is part of your assessment of the patient. You, you yeah. know, some people might come in the room, look at it and be like, eh, you know, whatever. I didn't notice it. Not a big deal. I'll adjust. I'll make the blood gas look like whatever. But it's a really good point that you make. If your patient is doing that throughout the duration of their ventilation, uh, when it does come time for them to actually use their musculature, you've, yeah. you've basically let them flounder and let them atrophy without being aware of that. So I really like that. Something yeah. else I find. It's all really about. Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, say it's something. all about oxygen preservation, right? Yeah. Like it's all about oxygen preservation, getting the oxygen to the right place. Yeah. Steve Yoon. Yeah. Of course. That's the other thing I found <laughs> you know, really interesting. So, um, so there's that too, just so you know. Yeah. 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 Good. Steve, thanks for stating the obvious, man. Um, oh my God. So yeah. So it's all about oxygen delivery, right? That's, that's what our business truly is. And so if we're wasting oxygen on respiratory muscles, that but then not getting any benefit you know it could be going elsewhere and so um yeah i think i think the downstream effects are huge um and probably an easy way is if you look at the monitor and the respiratory rate is a lot higher than what the ventilator respiratory rate is that's that's probably your your clue that oh wait maybe maybe there's this ineffective triggering right absolutely 
Sorry, sure. I stole, stole your thunder, Haney. What were you going to no, say? No, no, I was just going to say thanks for the super chat, Steve. That that's really awesome. <laughs> Steve, all right, let's uh, all right, let's keep going. Let's keep moving. All right, so <laughs> so that's ineffective triggering. Now let's talk about auto triggering, which is well, you tell me, it's kind of the opposite, right? Yeah, auto triggering is a, is an interesting phenomenon because there's a complete mismatch between you know the patient's desire to take a breath and the ventilator's interpretation of their desire to take a breath in right. the sense that the ventilator is just sensing all sorts of artifacts that you know aren't truly there and they're interpreting it as signs that the patient wants a breath and it's and it's and it's interesting because you can have respiratory rates that are absolutely through the roof like they, they can be breathing at rates well above 30 exactly you know they can have crazy respiratory rates but the thing that you'll notice if you look at that top pressure waveform there is no drop in airway pressure so those are not uh, uh, patient triggered breaths that's all the ventilator so you're saying right here right oops sorry yeah it, just, it stays at the baseline so those are not patient uh, triggered if it was That's patient just, triggered, we'd see something like this, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Great. Love it. So what are the things that can cause that? Yeah. So, so the, the ventilator, especially on a, on the flow sense, uh, on the flow trigger, um, it always has what you call this bias flow going through it is very low and then it can sense little deflections in it and little leaks in the circuit. So, if there's an air leak per se, uh, maybe the cuff isn't up or the cuff is down the, and the balloon is leaking, then there's a pressure difference that generated or a difference in flow that's generated between one end of the tube and the other. That can be sensed as a, a patient uh, a triggered effort. Um, if the patient has very large stroke volume, then that can change or kind of interfere with the pressure in the int uh, interthoracic space. And that can be detected Obi, as... Obi, I'm going to stop you, man. You're getting too smart. Just hit, <laughs> hit me. Hit me like four words. Right. I just want to hear what okay. causes it. Like All right. secretions in the tubing. Like hit me Hit me with the actual causes. All right. So you got your, your, your cardi cardiac oscillations, yep. um, a big air leak in the chest tube or a leak in the cuff, secretions in the ET tube. Uh, those are the big ones. Yeah. And it's almost always secretions, right? Like yeah. I've never seen an ET tube cuff leak cause that. It's usually the guy that's like traked and he's like laying and he's like all in the bed, right? And there's just like, you look in his tubing and there's just all the secretions and the machine is, yeah. and it's going back and forth and the machine is sensing that, that the flow oh, changes from the, from the tube, you know, the secretions going as a breath and it's going, and it's like exactly. a machine gun, right? Like boom, 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 boom. And so, so same thing as ineffective triggering, right? Patient issue, secretions in the tubing, or ventilator issue, sensitivity way too low. Turn up that sensitivity, make the threshold to get a breath harder, clear out the secretions, you're usually good. But yeah, like theoretical things like I've seen, actually I've seen um, a tonic clonic from post arrest, those patients that are having those like rhythmic jerking movements, I've seen that cause auto triggering. Um, yeah, those are the main things, right? Any another yeah. important another important point to make is actually because part of the solution of an ineffective triggering is to make the flow uh, trigger more sensitive. But if you make it too sensitive, you may go from ineffective triggering to auto triggering. So you have to be yep. careful. Can't win. Yep. <laughs> I'd say I'd take ineffective triggering any day over auto triggering. <laughs> That's a, a that was a little, that was a little, that was a little vent asynchrony joke for you. <laughs> Wait, I got something for that. Hang on. All right. <laughs> See, man, we, we really, we have it all here. Yeah, okay. we have a lot of um, big budget, big budget. All right. So I think um, those are the main two that I think I would, I would learn. Uh, there, you will read about things, double triggering you mentioned, I think you could make an argument that this is a cycling issue more. So we'll talk about it later. So kind of ignore that. But, and then there's things called reverse triggering and inappropriate triggering. So inappropriate triggering, triggering is just the patient is trying to take a breath in the middle of another breath already. 
So that let's leave it at that. If you type it in, you'll see some waveforms where you see a normal pressure curve and then you'll see there's like another little blip, but don't worry about it too much. That's inappropriate. They're trying to take a breath in the middle of another breath. And then something called reverse triggering is, um, it's a little bit like double triggering. So double triggering, they take a breath and then they immediately take another breath. So reverse triggering, the way I think about it, and you probably have a better understanding is a breath is delivered and then they immediately try to take another breath but it's not actually the second breath isn't delivered. That's how I think about reverse triggering versus double triggering. One gets two breaths. One is one, but two efforts. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add about those three. As I said, the double triggering thing, we're going to get into more depth. Yeah, they call they call reverse triggering like entrainment, which means essentially, you know, one system influences the other system. Mm -hmm. So it's like the breath is basically triggering a reflex and the diaphragmatic muscles to give another effort. So one breath, two efforts. Yeah, I. it makes sense when you read it, but then I like really try to understand it and it's it, it like doesn't really make sense. But um, but that's absolutely right. Uh, oh, you want, we got a question from Robert Bowman. Uh, what negative effects does auto-triggering cause to the patient? That's a, that's a good question. Well, you can imagine, you can only imagine that if you're, if you're anyone getting a respiratory rate of, of 30 breaths per minute, you know, you can only imagine you're not going to have enough time to exhale. So the end expiratory lung volume, the, the volume in the lungs left after each breath is just going to continue to accumulate. Pressure will build up and you can have barotrauma, volume yeah. trauma. The other, the other thing would be respiratory alkalosis, because let's say you set a rate of 12, but your patient's getting 20 something uh, because of auto triggering then the same effects, like they won't have neural drive, it'll be tough to wean those patients. And you might actually develop a diaphragmatic weakness just from um, impaired usage of those muscles. That's great. So those are yeah. probably- I always worry that they don't, they're not getting any volume at all. Sometimes it's like the rate is literally 50 and the tidal volumes going in are like 60 or 100. And I always worry yeah. that like, are they getting any minute ventilation at all? It's really, um, yeah. but you're right, tons of waste energy. It's it's bad news, man, bad news. Um, all right, great, let's move on. So that's that's triggering to the start of the breath problems. Now we're gonna move into how the breath is actually delivered. And I, I will admit this is probably one of my favorite asynchronies that happens all the time and people ignore, and that's flow starvation, right? Um, so let's, let's take a look at that and kind of walk me through what you notice, how you notice that there's a problem, and what the patient's asking for and kind of how do we fix it? Um, Cause actually, I think it's one of the more straightforward ones. Yeah, so if, if you look at each breath, uh, the key focus at the top waveform, the airway pressure, you see this uh, scooped in appearance or, or what you can even call like, a, a, like an upward concavity as uh, the breath is being delivered really at the, the inhalation phase. Um, right before it cycles to exhalation, it's concave upwards. And uh, so that really means the pressure in the system, um, it looks, appears to be lower because of the muscular effort. So the muscular effort actually subtracts from the total airway pressure. So um, these patients are definitely flow starved, they're air hungry. But basically yeah. that, that upward concavity represents the muscular effort of the patient while they're actually getting the breath, while flow yeah, so is being delivered. These breaths are always assist breaths, right? And I almost think of it like, like the patient starts and it, it's set at a set flow rate. This is actually interesting. This is volume control, but it's a decelerating flow. So you, normally I said, look at what's flat. So normally in volume control, that flow should be flat, but it's, it's downward. So, but anyway, I always think of it as kind of like, I think like they're, they're, they're like, you know, sucking on the ET tube and like pulling it down and uh, they just want flow to go faster, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is how the this is how the flow would look. Just so you know, we want to make sure that everyone's staying with us. The, normally, a normal flow or a normal pressure should look like this, and the patient sort of pulling in this way negatively leads to this, right? All right. Yep. Exactly. So, how do we yeah. fix it? So, for me, whenever, especially whenever I see flow starvation, the first thing I, I think about is is the patient comfortable? That's the most important thing for me, because if a patient's in pain, you know, they're anxious, um, that's going to increase their drive. And no matter what you do, no matter what you set, they are going to pull 
on the ventilator. But let's say the patient is, is you know, they're, they're not in pain, pain isn't an issue, but they just want more flow, then it depends on what mode you're in. You're gonna see this most awfully in fixed, uh, of mode where there's uh, fixed flow, like volume control. Um, and what you can do on volume control is you can increase the flow rate to give them that sensation of flow. Um, you can actually change the, it, well, some ventilators can do it. You can change the flow pattern to, uh, to match more of a pressure control type flow where it's decelerating. So they get most of that air in at the beginning of the breath. So they get that sensation of air going in and you can also increase the tidal volume or you can switch to pressure control, which is more flow variable which might be more comfortable for them uh, because the ventilator can actually match their effort and they can get more flow from the ventilator. Um, you can increase the rise time, um, which is the time to reach the peak pressure that you set on the ventilator, or you can simply also increase the pressure, the inspiratory pressure, because on pressure control, uh, flow is dependent of, uh, of the pressure you set. So if you increase the pressure, you'll get more flow. Um, that's great. Yeah. And let me just yep. say that the, the patients, they're, they're not, in most cases, they're not aware of all this. I, I think sometimes when I hear people talking about flow starvation, it's like, oh, it's the patient. It's like, imagine if you will, that you have a breathing tube, sometimes a very small breathing tube, because that's the only airway they can get. And now they're in this state of uh, variable consciousness where they're in this very unnatural situation. And so, you know, it's just a natural thing to want to take a deep breath. And that's where you uncover some of these things happening. So sedation, like you said, is a really good thing. Just get the patient calm again and let them be more synchronous with the ventilator. If that doesn't work, give them more flow. Perhaps they have a very small ET tube or maybe they just need more flow to satiate that need for more breath. Maybe this person is ARDS and pneumonia and they're hypoxemic. Our natural inclination when we're hypoxemic is to take bigger breaths and to breathe more frequently. You set the ventilator to the rate that you want, they're not going to get that. So delivering a flow faster might almost uh, just give them, satiate that need for what we call air hunger. But I just, I know that many people know that, but I think it's helpful to say that, um, realize that your patient doesn't always know what's happening. You're just trying to give them that innate need of they're okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think this concept is a good one to talk about because it's really what highlights like this is the argument why pressure control is better than volume control. So if you think about if everyone just kind of starts to take a breath themselves and you think about what's the flow greatest when we breathe normally, it's during the beginning of inspiration and then it decelerates down. And that, that is how the breath is delivered in pressure control because it's all the, the amount of air going in and the rate it's going in in pressure control is going to be based on the pressure differences between what you're sucking in and what's in the lungs. So at the beginning, the pressure is the lowest in the lungs because there's no air there, right? And as the lungs fill up, the pressure becomes closer to equal. And so that, you know, pressure control breathes more similar to us, the way we breathe, which is the problem with volume control, right? Because you set it 40 liters per minute, 50 liters per minute, and they start to take a breath and then it's delivered at the set rate until it hits at 400 cc's then it ends. And so it's just about usually giving them more flow faster. But your your point about sedation and comfort is is amazing. Cause I actually hadn't I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. It's like like if they're really hypoxic or they're really uncomfortable, they're gonna take in deep breaths. Um yeah. you gotta fix that to fix it. That's a really, really good point. I've seen that many times. Patients are are, are on Presidex solely as a sole agent while intubated or on propofol as a sole agent. But it's really the analgesia is the biggest thing. I think with the trainees I had today, we had a patient that was a perfect RAS of zero on the ventilator just with fentanyl. And whenever I see a RAS of zero, I have to highlight that. That's the sweet spot. There it is. That's what your goal is. And you're doing it with just fentanyl. That's amazing. I have a question. Yeah. Now, these are for mechanically ventilated patients, right, that we're talking about. What do I do when I'm air hungry on the Peloton? Like halfway through my ride, I'm, I'm starving for air. I feel like I'm going to die. What, what should I do? So, I'm so talking to question, Obi. Adam, I'm not talking what, to you. What I'm you do or what Obi on does? I'm, well, I, what, I'm what you do the is, I'm asking is, the expert. Is, you, you take a you stop. What Obi yeah. does is power Keeps through. You, you, you got to dig deep, man. That's all yeah. I can tell you. I knew he would say and, that. And what, 
what you need to do is we need to go to the gym a few times so I can just kind of get you where you need to yeah. be. Mm, yeah, I'm. <laughs> Why are you highlighting me? So you, hear, you heard, did you hear what he just said? He said that you would only have to go to the gym a few times to be the same physical shape as him. That's what he just said. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's incredible. I mean, Randy, Randy chimes in, of course. Well, there's Randy. There he is. There. No, go Randy. The couch. Yeah, Randy. It's, okay. it's a long story, Obi. Anyway, sorry. Go Let's ahead. keep moving. Is that okay? Can we move on to the third stage, cycling? Let's do it. Oh, look at that. You talked about the Peloton. That was like a perfect transition. You like that? Um, cycling? Cool. So um, what are we thinking about here for cycling? So I let's talk about premature cycling um, and what that means and how you recognize it and like what you do to fix it. Sure. So there, there's always uh, um, your brain naturally determines a time that you oh. uh, an inhalation time for you, a time that you want to a, a length of time that you want to be breathing in. And um, the ventilator can also um, set that as well. So. A premature cycling is essentially when the the ventilator inspiratory time is set shorter than the patient's own neurologically configured inspiratory time. So you want to keep breathing, but the ventilator doesn't want to let you breathe in as long as you'd like to. So you keep right. breathing, ventilator cycling to exhalation. Right. So do we have one of the waveforms of that? Uh, the one you showed was was a little different. I don't think that we do actually. Oh, that's was okay. It, was it the? No, I don't think we have one. Okay, nope. that's okay. So yeah, so I think I think that's I think that's enough. Is that essentially the breath is stopped, but the patient is still breathing in, and so what you'll see is you'll see oh, the. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll Hang, on. Hang on. There it is. What am I talking about? You'll here? see the pressure. Yep, perfect. You'll see the that... pressure. So the patient's taking a breath, right? The pressure is delivered, and then the breath cycles, where it turns from red to yellow, and then it it goes. But then you notice that little blimp directly after. That's the patient continuing to suck down. And exactly. so, so the way I think about it is they just want longer to breathe in. It's a little different than double triggering, which we'll talk about next, I think. But they just want longer to breathe in, right? So how do we yeah. fix that? So you can give them a longer time to breathe in, regardless of which mode you're on. So if you're if you're on volume control, you give the patient longer breath by, well, basically um, um, volume. If you increase your if you increase your volume, it'll take more time to get that breath in. Or if you decrease your flow rate, it'll also take more time to get that breath in, so they get a longer breath. But mind you. In, in premature cycling, it can also be because a patient wants a prolonged inspiratory time, but can also be because they have more of a ventilatory demand. So if you're on volume control and that and that patient has both of those factors coupled in, then just giving them a longer breath may not always solve the problem, especially if you're at a fixed flow rate. They may want that sensation of higher flow for longer. So. Uh, um, a mode like pressure control, increasing the inspiratory rise, adding pressure, and increasing your inspiratory time might help you get rid of that dyssynchrony. Right. Perfect. So I like to keep it simple. So they want longer to breathe than you're giving them. Volume control, you decrease the flow. So more of your breath cycle, but more of the breath time is going to be in the inspiratory phase versus the expiratory phase. So your I to E ratio will be going down, right? And if it's pressure control, you just drop your eye time or you increase your eye time. Same concept, right? Exactly. Cool. Um, you could also always just sedate the patient more, right? Um, you could. And well, if, if the, only, the only the only thing for that is if it's ARDS. You know, there's some there's some dyssynchronies that you just can't afford to have, especially in the early phases of ARDS, where you know, in the early phase of ARDS is where you have your best chance to really impact the course of, of, of that illness. And when you're talking about having strict lung protective ventilation, things like flow starvation uh, um, or, or premature cycling or what can follow premature cycling is it, are things you just can't have under any circumstances. So in that case, you may need to just really crank up the analgesia and sedation and if that doesn't work, then you might have to employ neuromuscular blockade. 
Oh, I like how he didn't say paralysis, neuromuscular <laughs> blockade. So academic. That's awesome. Okay. Um, now, I why? So now, talk to me about what double triggering is and how that's a little bit different um, than premature cycling. Yeah. So, so they both exist in the spectrum. So, and 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 premature cycling, the patient continues to make an effort, even though the ventilator has cycled into exhalation, they're still making that effort. In double triggering, um, the only difference is in premature cycling, they're continuing to make an effort, but they're not able to trigger the ventilator to give a second breath. But in double triggering, they are. So typically those patients, you know, they have those factors coupled. They have high demand and they have high neurological inspiratory time so they want that breath and they want it so badly that they're strong enough that uh, to continue to trigger the ventilator even when it's cycled back into exhalation so you know you'll see exactly if you look at that um if you look at the flow waveform there you'll see at, at that dotted line there that's their continuing effort so they're generating a continued effort and it's strong enough that there's essentially no expiratory time there so the the exhalation valve opens and pressure drops momentarily and then comes right back up as they get extra flow and extra volume perfect do you see you see why i moved it down to the cycling asynchrony i think it makes more sense it's always yeah. introduced as a triggering it's called double triggering it's called you know it's a trigger asynchrony i really think it makes more sense it's 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 the same concept as premature cycling but they're just it's either Either I think also sometimes with premature cycling where the effort happens in that delayed phase, there is a small phase after after the breath is delivered, where no matter how strong you are, you're not going to be able to, there's a, a latency phase, right, where you can't exactly. then cause another breath. So, um, so yeah. And so how do you fix this? I mean, this you see, I guarantee almost every ICU in America right now, there's someone on a ventilator doing this. It's just so common. So how do you how do you fix this? Exactly. So Number one, is the patient comfortable? Address that, you know, analgesia and, and optimize sedation, but mostly analgesia. If it's ARDS, just can't have it, take control completely. Um, otherwise, they want, they, they have demand. So you need to meet that demand, increase your, your flow rate. If you're on a volume control, give them more volume. Or if you're on pressure control, increase the pressure, um, increase your rise time and increase your, your inspiratory time. Uh, we're not are we talk, we're not talking about pressure support are we no okay not allowed okay not allowed so yeah i usually they just want more volume that's honestly usually the answer is you just increase the volume or you change them to pressure support or pressure control and what it see what you did to me and uh and when you change the pressure control what happens they get it as we learned it's dependent on the patient the volume is dependent on the patient so all of a sudden they can kind of determine how much volume they want when they're on pressure control and so that usually fixes it right um yes and just briefly when we talk about lung protective strategy especially with what we just went through in the Ooh. past couple of years right so we say you know just increase the volume but what did you can't increase the volume what do you do in those cases so let's say you're you have to stay for this person on you know four cc's per kg. That's just what you have to do, and you're getting this. Uh, you know we can easily say paralysis. We don't want to par paralyze. Oh, we don't want to use neuromuscular blockade. We want to, and we don't want to keep our patients deeply deeply sedated. So what are some other strategies that we can do? So the rise rise time is definitely mm -hmm. you know the rise time is on a pressure control setting is definitely um, one way because they'll they'll get that sensation of flow better if you're on volume control switch to um a decelerating uh, a flow waveform those uh, that can help and of yeah. course maximize your analgesia so that they're able to tolerate yeah and if you have to stay on volume then give them a faster flow rate right you just increase the flow and decrease your eye time essentially give them a little more um e time there there's a balance there but i just want to make sure that people don't walk around say well we were on lung protective but because of this we have to go to higher modes um, there are ways around it within a lug protect strategy framework. Yeah, Haney, I gotta, I gotta jump in too. You know, you know how much I love ARDS, and and you always do. You, you like you, ARDS? We've we've made it almost to eight o'clock, and you haven't made fun of me. So this is a time where I like, get really close and start talking fast because you know I'm like super super into it. Let's so go. I think this is just so important. I hope I really hope people listen to it. Is that first off, 
everyone hears 6 cc's per kg. 6 cc's has not been shown to be superior to 8 cc's as far as I know. We generally pick 6 cc's because the patients with ARDS also have stiff lungs, so you're trying to minimize the plateau pressure, right? But this is, and, and I'm all for lung protective ventilation. I get it. No matter, even if you don't have ARDS, it's good to be lung protective. But the problem with it is that there's small tidal volumes, like 300, 400 cc's. Me and you, we're breathing two, three times that right now. So it's uncomfortable. So then you, you're forced with having to sedate the patient to fix this dyssynchrony. Oh, dyssynchrony. You're fixing this dyssynchrony. So what I do is if the airway pressures are fine, I sometimes break eight cc's and I go higher, you know, and I think what's worse, a, you know, a little bit extra tidal volume and maybe volume trauma or having to increase the sedation. And like if I had the classic patient is the neuro injured patient, post cardiac arrest, totally clear lungs, huge respiratory drive. Sometimes I just let them breathe the way they want to breathe. And I think that that is superior and let them breathe 10 cc's per kg. And I think that is superior than full sedation to say that we have to, we have to lung protect them like ARDS, even though they don't have ARDS. So maybe that's a little controversial, but that's, I feel, I feel strongly about that. Yeah. I had to what do you think, Katie? I had to, well, yeah, I mean, there, there are studies that show that, you know, for patients who are non IRDS, that you can push them higher as, you know, beyond that up to 10 cc's, um, which we should actually do a show on that, on, on uh, lung protective strategy versus non. But yes, you're absolutely correct. If you're not talking about an ARDS patient, driving them up higher is is absolutely okay. The number six to eight was was sort of picked and then studied continuously and continued to show better outcomes. But when people went back to that and said, well, what if we would study eight to 10 again with yeah. a non-ARDS patient? It turns out that it's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, comparing six I, versus 12 is just, that's, yeah, that's right. Like, it's so like, of course it's going to be bad, but, right. uh, but so, yeah. Yeah, and we don't get in the I weeds the here, thing. but like that. But go ahead, Obi. No, I think the main thing is, is looking at the airway pressures, kind of like you mentioned earlier, Adam. You know, because I think in a lot of the other studies, people weren't necessarily paying as close attention to airway pressures as we do now. You know, doing looking at plateau pressures, calculating best PEEP and, and static compliance. So I think on top of the the eight to ten cc's. You know, I think just ventilator management protocols are just more way more sophisticated now, and we're just doing things a lot more sophisticated and better at this point. And hopefully this answers Robert's question. I just want to get him up on the screen here. So yeah, I mean, again, we're talking to the non ARDS patient. I think most people would go to 10 as the yeah. maximum. Um, and again, in, and the study's name escapes me right at this moment, but uh, you know, it, it was a recent study. Um, those patients went up to 10 and then they tried to get them back down again, but just knowing that up to 10 is okay. It also just depends on your goal, right? Neuro injured patient, chain stoking, huge breath followed by some small breaths. You're trying to really neuroprognosticate and work with the family, you know, and keeping them off sedation may be worth it. It just really depends on the patient. But yeah, I think that's that's really great stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's All great. Right. Okay, so what else? Um, I think we're almost done because I know it's like we're pushing past eight o'clock. But so that's double triggering. How about, and we talked about premature cycling. How about delayed cycling? I don't think there's a, a, a slide for this, but what's the concept behind delayed cycling? So delayed cycling is, is, is uh, the opposite. Essentially, the patient wants a shorter breath than that which is programmed on the ventilator. So the patient, the, they start to engage their expiratory muscles before the inhalation valve on the ventilator actually closes. So when that happens, you get a little pressure blimp upwards. So if you had a, so nope, at nope, the tail, so, sorry, well, yeah, you, I, I hit the wrong you, button. Oh, no worries. Because what I was going to say is like, even on that pressure waveform at the top one, right before it cycles, you see a little blimp upwards usually, and that signifies the patient's uh, expiratory effort and engaging their expiratory muscles. Oh, um, what, what can be risky about that is it, it can lead to um, it can cause intrinsic PEEP. I know we're not talking much about intrinsic PEEP here, but it's, it, it can lead to intrinsic PEEP because it means that a patient might be getting a longer breath than they actually want to, which means that they may have a higher end expiratory lung volume, which can cause auto PEEP. 
And then that in turn can cause an effective triggering. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So I think of it as simple as that is the vent, the vents given the breath, the patient's done given the breath, uh, you know, they don't want it anymore. And so they start to exhalation. And so yeah. how would you fix it? Well, you give them a shorter ride time, right? Mm -hmm. So you try to match what they want. Um, yeah. Perfect. And then, you know, I, I don't know if there's any questions. I think the last kind of phase is the expiratory phase. And I, I'm, I'm thinking we should not talk about this right now. Um, other than saying, this is the concept of, of um, breath stacking, right, right here, which is the concept that the patient doesn't, well, you tell me what's happening here. So if you, the, the, the key thing to highlight is looking at the flow waveform, and it looks like the, the ventilator, the next breath is starting before exhalation has been complete. So there's an issue with expiration um, and that's causing progressive increase in, in lung volumes, which leads to air trapping, intrinsic PEEP and, and can cause barotrauma and all those complications. So the patient okay. needs more time to exhale. Yep. And so how do we do that? So that was kind of like what I mentioned a lot earlier. I, I'm still trying to understand this arbitrary respiratory rate of 20 in, uh, that I see in, in, in a lot of patients. You know, patients don't need, when we chase perfection, chase the perfect blood gas, you know, chasing perfection is the easiest way to hurt a patient. You know, we don't need them to have a perfect blood gas. We can get away with a little hypercapnia, a little bit of respiratory acidosis. You can drop the respiratory rate, you know, increase or, or decrease your inspiratory time and allow for a better uh, IDE ratio so the patients can exhale. And if you see this kind of waveform with this level of auto peak and your patient has a respiratory acidosis and you just reflexively increase the rate, there's a good chance you're gonna cause worse acidosis to begin with. All right, Obi. This is your third warning. <laughs> How do you fix it was the question. So yeah, you implied drop, drop, drop the respiratory rate, right? So if your respiratory rate is 20, you have three seconds per breath. If you drop it to 15, you get four seconds per breath. If your I to E ratio stays the same, you just will by definition have longer I and longer E. So they, so they have more time to exhale. What's another way? You could or decrease just, your uh, tidal volume, right? Yeah, if you yeah. decrease your tidal volume, then the breath goes in. If the flow is the same, now this is a pressure control mode, but still, if the flow is the same and volume control, and by decreasing the tidal volume, it'll go in. Uh, it'll go in faster, so you have long to exhale, longer to exhale, right? But you have to think about yeah. acid base status to make either of those decisions. The next way is to deliver the breath faster. So that more of those three seconds, if the rate's at 20, can is, is in the E phase. So increase the flow for volume control, increase the I time for pressure control. And this, um, decrease this the happens, time. yeah, decrease I time, yeah. Sorry. And, and I just, just to point out, because all, all this is, is clear to us, but we've been doing this for a long time, for, for people who are just learning fence, realize that you know, this is sort of your cycle time, right? And our goal here is, you know, if this is your inspiration and this is your expiration, you're trying to get as much time in expiration as possible. You're trying to move everything this way. And so by decreasing the tidal volume, you're putting less air in to the lungs. So there's a shorter amount of inspiratory time, easier. You spend more time in expiration. When you when you increase your flow rate, you're getting the same tidal volume that you wanted before in a much faster rate than you had before. And obviously decreasing the respiratory rate by default sort of stretches this out. So it's all about increasing the e the expiratory time. And by doing that, you're going to allow their breath to get a lot closer to that baseline than before. Absolutely. Beautiful. And to, to Obi's point, and I, I really like it, you know, we, we have to avoid perfection when you're taking care of critically ill patients. Sometimes you accept permissive hypercapnia just because you know that patient is going to need time. If we're talking about COPD or asthma, for example, permissive hypercapnia is going to allow the steroids to kick in, all the other medication to kick in just for them to just bronchodilate and things will get better. But if you try to keep kicking them down 
and go with the same respiratory rate just to make that blood gas look good, you're going to cause more bowel trauma and possibly more complications, pneumothoraces, hemodynamic instability, all the bad things. So very important to, to, to realize that it's okay to be acidotic as long as you understand these waveforms. And the last thing I'll say about this is oftentimes I don't wait for the blood gas when I have auto peep. I don't wait for the blood gas when I'm having when I'm having breath stacking. I sit in front of the ventilator and I make these changes until I see that waveform come up as close as I can to that baseline and then I send the blood gas. Because if I have a waveform that shows this, I know the blood gas might look crappy and I, I know that the patient is looking awful as well. So sit there, adjust, make your adjustments until you see the waveform smooth out, come back to baseline and then send off your blood gas. Yeah, the first the first time when someone is acidotic and they're breath stacking and their rate's at like 32 and you walk into the room and you change the rate to 16 and they actually fully exhale and then you send a blood gas and their CO2 is better. It's like the first time you do it and it works, it's just, it, it's, it's something you'll always remember. Sure. And the last thing I think we should talk about is what happens when they develop tension physiology for breath stacking. What do you do? That's, that's the whole unplug the ventilator, right? That's the board question is like, as you know, young asthmatic gets intubated, they show that, that waveform, they're hypotensive, tachycardic, what do you do? And it has a whole bunch of fancy paralysis, you know, chest x-ray, a whole bunch of things. And the answer is unplug the ventilator, you know, just unplug the tubing, let all that air back out, yeah. plug it back in, then try to figure out how to fix the. Absolutely. Fix the and I would, even though it's not part of ACLS, I would go far as to say in hospital, cardiac arrest or someone who is having by history, a CPD exacerbation at home and collapses short of breath before they collapse at some point in that arrest, unplugging the person from the ventilator and gently pushing down on their chest to sort of release that compartment should be part of your algorithm. Um, I've just seen already three people in my career get ROSC just by that move of just pushing down on their chest, releasing the air, and uh, and then just sometimes you get return of spontaneous circulation. Absolutely. Cool. Obi, All right, thank James. you for uh, for breaking down. I think what is a really complex topic, but I hope, I, I think we were able to work through each stage think about the possible problems, think about how to fix it. And I hope, um, I hope it gave everyone a little bit of a framework and, uh, you know, Haney and I are more than happy to, to jump more into each or any of these that people, people think would be beneficial because uh, there's definitely more to get into. Yeah, absolutely. I think the main thing is just, um, you know, look at the waveforms. I think the easiest thing is look at the waveforms, uh, on, on, the, on look at the patient and, no irregularities, and then really think about what can be going on. I think that's one of the first steps if you're trying to really learn vents and learn dyssynchrony. You have to spend time in front of the ventilator and actually feeling the patient and trying to see what is the discordance between both machine and patient. Love Absolutely. It. Absolutely. Obi, thank you so much for being on. Uh, again, we're going to give this handout um, as soon as the, the lounge ends. Give us five minutes. I'm going to put the link in the description. It's going to be right there in the bio. You go click on it. You download the PDF. Maybe you want to watch this again. I'm not saying that to get views. I mean, you're going to have to watch this again to let this sink in a little bit. Do it with the PDF. Mark it up. And then take this with your shift. Start looking at your patient's waveforms on rounds. We listen to the heart. We listen to the lungs. Do a physical exam. This should be part of your physical exam, assessing the patients. But... Obi, that was fantastic. Hopefully we can get you on here again to talk maybe more event sure. stuff, maybe something different next time, but we really appreciate sure. you being on. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to, it was great so. to have you guys and, and hang out. <laughs> For sure. Anytime, For sure. Man. Cool. You know, that was great, Haney. One thing I, I realized, we should also give credit to some of the sites that we pulled those images from mm -hmm. and got a lot of this content. So if you don't, Deranged Physiology, I love it. I think it's some really great, easy to read articles. Um, really? Life in the Fast Lane, I, I always go there. I think the way they break things down and the bullet points are, are outstanding. Um, there's a couple articles that I think we drew from that we can put in the handout probably. And then I love, um, there's also this, it's the Toronto Center of Excellence in Mechanical Ventilation. Um, really good, really good stuff that's easy to understand and kind of work through. For sure, agreed. 
Um, all right, Adam. Well, this was a great lounge. Really, this was like one of our more academic, heady lounges. But again, I, I, this is something that I had a hard time with during fellowship. And uh, it took, if I had this lounge when I was in fellowship, I would have understood a lot quicker. I like how you broke it down. And hopefully, again, this handout is going to help people get along. And we're here for you. Drop in the comments. You know, Email us if you have any questions. We're happy to help you get through and give you more resources as needed. Yep. Awesome. All right, Adam. Thanks, Great to see you. Go Flyers. And uh, we will see you in a couple of weeks with the next lounge. Absolutely. Bye for now.